Welcome to We Choose to Thrive. This is our interview series with women who have decided to rise above the abuse, no matter what kind of abuse it was, of their past, and to live rich, full lives. We hope you will enjoy our interview series. So, Morel Wright, thank you so much for joining us for our We Choose to Thrive series. I'm so delighted that you're, you've decided to be with us and to share your story. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to do this. <laughs> so give us a, a little bit of background on why you're here today and what led you to the place that you are in this moment. Well, a little bit about me is I've always been a little bit of an overachiever, but you know, I also had a story of abuse starting at a very young age, about three or four years of age that I can remember. And unfortunately, most of the male figures in my life had always put me down or called me names. It's, you know, and as a preteen and a teenager, I looked older for my age. And mm -hmm. so men would make passes at me or sexual advances towards me. So that's when I started feeling and had beliefs that I was not worthy, not being, you know, I wasn't lovable, feeling disgusting and feeling like a nuisance to everyone. So that kind of become a foundation of what was to come later on. And this kept me in survival mode to where I always felt shame and detachment, depression and abandonment. And, you know, the abandonment was so strong that I was afraid to lose anybody in my life. So I was in dead end relationships that mm -hmm. I now discovered were abusive. And I was promiscuous in hopes that I would feel loved and safe at one point in my life. So when I met my ex-husband, I thought all of it was behind me. And uh, we dated for about a year and a half before getting married, and I was absolutely content. You know, we were married for 10 years, together for 12, and I had three wonderful stepchildren that I absolutely love and am still in contact with today. He was very supportive, and I had a great career, so I felt like everything was great. My life was perfect. And then one day I just, it all came crashing down when I found out that he had cheated on me. And that led me totally devastated because I never thought that that would ever happen to me. And I had no idea how to cope. It was, mm -hmm. you know, to me, it was like a death. You know, I, I felt loss and I felt grief. And so we separated for two months until I found out one of my stepdaughters was pregnant at the age of 16. So we discussed to agree to make our marriage work. And almost three months later, this is where everything kind of came tumbling down on me. I never thought I would experience domestic violence myself. I was a 911 dispatcher for 14 years. And you know what it's all about. I do. And I dealt with these victims on a daily basis and never quite understood. You know, I always said, gosh, just get out of that you know, just leave. But then, you know, being a victim myself, I realized that it's not that easy. So one night, my ex-husband had too much to drink. We were arguing. And I went to go walk past him. And he pushed me into the wall where I hit the corner of the windowsill. And I went completely black. And when I came to, I noticed I was on the floor and things started coming into focus and I saw that he had a shotgun and to this day I don't know if it was actually pointed at me or not I just remember the shotgun and he looked down at me with you know and I saw the fear and regret in his eyes because he'd never been abusive to me before and at that time he left the house and I ended up calling the police which was really hard for me to do because these were my coworkers, mm -hmm. and I had to be, mm -hmm. it was so hard to have to tell them that I was now a victim. So I reported it to the police and I was taken to the hospital and ended up having a concussion. And of course they questioned me on what happened and you know, I know that they weren't fooled. I know that they knew because they were leading towards the domestic violence questions. And I, of course, protected him and said, oh, I just tripped and ran into the windowsill. So eventually I lost my job as a dispatcher. And that was just due to because 
due to not being able to cope with what had happened. I had so many things going on. I just, I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. I, my identity was his wife. I did not have my own identity. So at that point, I went into a, a real dark period for almost a year, and I felt like there was no way out. I uh, always felt like I was going to feel this way. This was the norm. The emotional pain to me was so overwhelming that I just didn't want to be here anymore. I get that. And it's not that I wanted to die. It's just the pain. I wanted it to stop. And so I'd taken a handful of pills and ended up calling my best friend. He came right over. And if it wasn't for him, I don't believe I would be here today. Uh, he found me unconscious. So, of course, you know, he was doing what he knew, you know, for f first, di first aid and uh, first responder. So, you know, he called the ambulance and everything. But due to my emotional uh, state and my health, my mom and my stepdad talked me into moving from Oregon to Arizona. And that's how I got here. And it ended up being the best thing that I've ever done in my life. Um, it was really difficult. I'm not good with change. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I also realized that I was suffering from PTSD. And I just, it was really difficult for me to accept because the stigma is it just happens to veterans or policemen. But little did I know it happens to a lot of people. It does happen to a lot of people. So where are you now in your healing journey? My healing journey, I feel like I am in such an amazing place. You know, it wasn't easy to get to where I am now. Uh, at times, it was downright painful. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at the point where my mission and passion lie in domestic violence, abuse, advocacy, and awareness. Uh, my motto is to never let anyone be alone in their struggle. And I want, you know, men, because they are also victims and they are. survivors of domestic violence, they are. women to know that, you know, there is life after abuse. I just don't want anyone to feel alone, surrounded by darkness. I've been there and it's just a horrible place to be. So how did you come out? Was there, what resources did you tap into? Did you, were there books, were there, there support systems that, I know you went to your family, but aside from that, what did you tap into? Well, the only thing, I mean, I can say just get help. And its it wasn't easy because I just kept getting the runaround. And I was frustrated to the point where I almost gave up. But I fought for the therapy, and I finally found somebody that listened to me. So I was lucky enough to get individualized uh, trauma therapy. But I also did what they call DBT therapy, dialectal behavioral therapy, which was, I absolutely recommend this to anybody and everybody, no matter what they've been through. You just learn to tap in on skills that you already know about, but you put a label to, and so it's a little bit easier to use them when you need them. And then I also went through the EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that was one of the most difficult things I've ever been through because I had to relive that trauma to process mm -hmm. it. And that was very difficult, but that's something that I just, I can't say enough, you know, about, I was so blessed and I just hope everybody would try and continue to push to get that therapy. Find something that works for them. Yes. Well, I find that I so relate to many aspects of your story. And um, one of the things that I disco have discovered that for those of us that have had abuse as a child, our, we don't have the groundwork and the framework around us that when we go into adulthood, we seem to hmm, attract the very thing that, that we, what we're familiar with. Right. What we, what we know and what we're familiar with. So as we go through this process, there's a, there's a lot of learning. There's a lot of self-discovery. There's so much that goes on. It's like a whole new, we have to be, re, we have to be educated in, in a lot Absolutely. of different ways. And our, we identify, I understand the promiscuity because we're looking for love, but we're looking for it in all the wrong places. Yes. But it's because we're, we're equating love to the actual somebody taking care of us even 
the sexual part. It's, right. It's just, it's, it's a crazy thing, but it's because if we didn't have the, the solid framework as a child, you know? Right. And so for those who are watching our videos and, and reading the We Choose to Thrive series, if somebody's just starting down this journey and just in those same shoes that you were with the, when you first experienced the domestic violence or even before that, what would you say to them? To get help. I mean, reach out and also get rid of toxic people in your life. Uh, and it's hard to recognize because you don't want to lose anybody. A lot of people, I think, suffer from abandonment issues and that loss is feeling like they put it on themselves and like they failed or that they're not worthy and so it's real difficult at times to try and get that help because you don't realize you need it but i mean what's the worst that's going to happen with therapy you know um maybe it won't work i went through several therapists before i finally found one that helped me and i it was very difficult, but reach out and help some, you know, reach out to get help from somebody, start developing your support group and be very aware of who's there to be, to support you and who's there just to hear the, the story and, you know, and pass judgment. Right. Because that happens so often because, of course, unless you've been through it, you don't understand it. And validate your feelings make sure that you know that those are your feelings and they're valid and that what you went through was very traumatic very good so out of everything you did was there one thing that was most beneficial to you uh there's two the therapies that i went through that i uh, talked about earlier and then um talking about it i realized that some people don't have it in them to be a voice for the voiceless, and that's what I want to do. I want people to know that, you know, again, life after abuse, because I, I'm very proud of where I am. I'm a thriving businesswoman that is excited for what's to come. I'm making healthy decisions, have great boundaries. So that's wonderful. Just, you're you're yeah. worthy. You are worthy of good things that can happen but you've got to work for it yes and it becomes down to a decision and a choice um you know because we can wallow for a very long time and mm -hmm. the pain of it all and the feeling sorry for ourselves and the, the the darkness of it all but when we start to when we make those choices and we decide that this is we're going to make the changes that are necessary really choose to thrive is, is Absolutely. such an important role. Very good. This has been a beautiful interview. I so thank you for taking the time to, to, to join us in this and, Absolutely. and for your passion to make a difference for others. It's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity. This is why you call. Thank you. Thank you for watching this We Choose to Thrive interview. If you are currently in an abusive situation, please seek help immediately. Our purpose in creating this book and video series is to form a sisterhood of support. Know that abuse is abuse no matter what kind it is. The stories in this We Choose to Thrive series are as many and varied as the people in it. If this resonates with you, we welcome you and invite you to join us. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing this interview, please feel free to share.